Hi everyone and welcome to the Peanut Labs Ask the Expert Anything broadcast. My name is Annie Pettit and I'm the Chief Research Officer at Peanut Labs, a company that specializes in self-serve DIY sample. I will be your host and moderator for the next 25 minutes. Now, in these AMA broadcasts, we talk to thought-leading market researchers about anything that interests you. So are you curious about their take on probability samples? Are you curious if they've been a senator or opened a school for orphans? <laughs> All of these questions are fair game in our Ask Me Anything time. It can be completely market research related or not even close. You get to be the virtual interviewer. We already have uh, some other broadcasts planned. Um, here you see we've got Tom Webster, VP of Edison Researcher, lined up. He is um, also known as Brand Savant or Webby2001. So you can head over to the Peanut Labs resources page and sign up for that, as well as a couple other web webinars if you'd like. So in today's AMA, we are talking with Jim Bryson, who is the CEO of 2020 Research, and he has an impressive uh, resume. So if you have any questions for Jim, feel free to write those questions in the box on the side of your screen. I'll start off with a couple introductory questions, and then we'll jump into as many of your questions as we can. So, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Andy, it's a, it's a pleasure and really an honor to be here, especially the way you described uh, the, the, that you're pulling together, trying to pull together thought leaders. That's, uh, well, that's an honor and, and a, a privilege. I'm uh, a little bit wondering about the picture you just put up with me. Um, I, th I feel like I ought to be able to deny that, but I don't think I can. <laughs> You know, everybody has a little bit of personality, whether they want to admit it or not, and I'm glad to see you have some. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, this will be fun. I'm looking forward to it, so thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to have you. So to start things off, why don't you take a few minutes to tell everyone who you are and what you're passionate about? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that's a wide open field. Well, okay, so I'm Jim Bryson, obviously, and um, I am uh, um, I'm the CEO of 2020 Research. Uh, we are uh, we do qualitative. I've done qualitative my entire career, which now 2020 has been around over 27 years. We're working on 28. Uh, traditional qualitative, and then about uh, 12, 13, 14 years ago now, we got started getting into technology. And so now we develop uh, qualitative technology that's used uh, – something in over 100 countries and 26, 27 languages. Um, so that's what I do for a living. Uh, when you ask what I'm passionate about, um, I am passionate about the company, I'm passionate about research, but uh, over the year, over the last uh, uh, three to four years, I've gotten very passionate about working in Haiti. I love uh, what we're doing down there. We're building a school for orphan children, uh, specifically a secondary school, because um, a lot of the kids um, don't have any opportunity, since they don't have a public education, have any opportunity to uh, continue their education and obviously become leaders and have, make a great impact on their community. So we want to we want to try to help that and basically kind of leverage our investment to pay it forward and and create a um, and create leaders for tomorrow uh, that will you know, pay off for years to come. And I guess that, and then the other thing I guess is my family. It's um, you know I've got four kids, a wife and four kids, and i um, really blessed. So I guess those are kind of the highlights of my life and what makes me tick. I don't know how you stay on top of all those things. How, how did you originally get into or figure out a school was an important thing that needed to be done and it was going to be you to do it? How did you get there? Well, actually, I, um, um, I w right after the earthquake, I was asked to go down, actually through my church, I was asked to go down and, and check out a, um, uh, an opportunity to potentially build an orphanage um, and with, an, uh, with a team, and we, did a, we visited several orphanages, and I came back with some impressions that, were, that I couldn't really shake. And one was that um, there's a lot of things that are broken in Haiti, and when I say that, I mean like electricity sometimes, health care is very poor, a lot of the systems that we take for granted. 
uh, just don't work. And from my uh, experience, uh, that is simply be, uh, lack, that's that can be fixed with leadership. Uh, so they, I, it was pretty apparent to me that they don't have a broad uh, leader base of leaders in that country that can make a difference for the uh, population. The other thing is that um, uh, I'm very interested in orphans. What I didn't say is three of my children are adopted, so I've got an interest in that. Um, and I noticed that the orphans never didn't really have an opportunity to complete their education past about the six, sixth grade because there's not a public education system to speak of in Haiti. I kind of put those two thoughts together and, and came up with this idea for a um, for a school to, um, uh, to kind of help educate the kids. When it um, went back down in July of that year um, to kind of test the idea, talk to people about it. And I got thumbs up everywhere I went. And so I guess when I came back to the States, we just decided to start putting together an organization to make that happen. And where we are today is um, we are um, we broke ground in January and we're starting to build. So we're raising money to actually build and to run the school now. Um, we have what we've acquired land and we're an official Haitian organization. All of those things are very difficult down there, but we've been fortunate enough to get that done. So it's moving forward and, and it's a passion and it's uh, an awful lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Oh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that. Uh, it sounds like in your entire life, whatever you do, leadership is something that you're you're really great at. Uh, and I, I wonder, why did you decide to start your own company, lead your own company, instead of simply join another existing company? <laughs> well, because I didn't have any other options. Um, <laughs> I was okay. So okay. So to, in, in full transfer, when you get to be old like me, you can tell <laughs> stories on yourself. And so the the real truth is that um, I got out of graduate school and really wanted to be a brand manager. Um, and I thought I was going to be the next next greatest thing at, at P and G after graduate school. And the only problem really was that um, P and G didn't want to hire me. So <laughs> So I ended up getting a job in a research firm and worked there for about nine months before I was fired and um, lost that job. And so I was essentially unemployed and trying to figure out what to do with my life. I was kind of a young single guy unemployed and didn't know what to do. Uh, this guy comes to me who had been a brand manager at P&G and he said, he said, hey, I want to start a company. I understand you're a researcher. And I said, well, I've been fired as one, if that counts. <laughs> um, so, um, he, so he said, well, help me do the research. Anyway, we started talking and we decided to start a research firm. So we started 2020 research, and uh, two years later, he had a job offer, and he ended up leaving the company. I decided to keep it going, and um, and that was uh, that was 1988. And so we've been going ever since. How did you land in the qualitative side of things? You know, the vast majority of market researchers it, they just go directly to quant. You know, skip qual. How did you land there? Well, in about uh, we did we we started out qualitative. Uh, we have we started out with a facility, a one little one room facility, and and went got some training and hung out our shingle as moderators. But we quickly got into quant actually, um, and, and we I did that until about uh, well in 1995. A uh, company had grown a good bit, but I, but it wasn't healthy, and I was working you know 14, 16 hours a day, and uh, the company I knew wasn't healthy. It wasn't making money like I like it needed to, and. So I really did some soul searching and realized that what was going on was I was working to feed this uh, quantitative monster, and my qualitative shop was running pretty smoothly. So what I ended up doing is at that point was I say I sold the quantitative piece. I virtually gave it away, um, but got but moved it over to another company, and we just went. We just decided to focus on qualitative. And so since 1996, uh, we've just we've kind of stayed with that mantra and said, you know, we're going to do one thing and do it really, really well, and that's qualitative research. And we've we've resisted the urge to become a quant shop. <laughs> so, what is your favorite qualitative tool, or if you have a couple of favorites, what are those? <laughs> um, truthfully, yeah, I do. Uh, in-person IDIs, love them, especially with older people. There is, there's nothing like sitting down and having an opportunity to really get to know someone and understand what makes them tick, how they relate to whatever the product or service is that you're talking about. Um, I just, I love that, and um, I, uh, I kind of, I don't do do it much anymore professionally, um, and I kind of miss that piece of it. Um, but I love that. That's my favorite. Um, I think there's tons and tons. You know, what's 
I think we're in the most exciting time that's ever in research probably, but for sure in qualitative. And what I'm talking, and I think that one-on-one -on -one interview will always be there uh, just because it's so rich and so helpful and, and you can get such insights and depth out of it. Um, but all the new tools, I, but I get so excited and almost giddy about some of the new tools that allow us to do things better in a lot of, in a, in a, in a lot of ways if they're used right. I do find it interesting that you mentioned a good old-fashioned traditional tool and as your number one, as opposed to any of the hundreds of fancy, smancy, technical, technological devices that could be right at your fingertips. Yeah, and you know, and what we do is we design, you know, we develop software for quality, so we're developing those tools, but, and, and a lot of them are really, really helpful, and they're great, and they're good. Uh, for a lot of specific situations and a lot of things that um, that a lot of ways to get you know get better uh, to to get you know we got you know we've got a mobile streaming tool that I think is a cool way to interview people in their homes but but it's not my favorite it's not what I like to do uh, we've got a lot of a lot of cool stuff and there's more you know technology is just exploding and so there's and and if you if you if you're in the technological space right now. I think you just when you stop and you look around and you see what um, not only what is here but what's coming, um, it's just it's just mind-boggling, especially for somebody like me that remembers when the only question anybody asked when they wanted to qualitate it was how many focus groups, and uh, and we used to get into arguments about whether six or eight was the right number, and that those are just so those are just old school now. But anyway, it's an exciting time, and and it's a wonderful time. But I don't, I still love the uh, the uh, in person uh, interview. I think that's still my favorite. So, how do you respond to people who who think, well, you know, you can't generalize from qualitative research. It's only good for hypothesis generation and and very basic kinds of things. Yeah, well, I understand why they say that. I think from an academic perspective, I totally get that. If uh, if they've done much qualitative, what you find is that, what I find is, I, you know, let's take IDIs that I was just talking about, for instance. You know, my clients used to ask me, well, how many of these do I need to do? And what I would find is I would do about eight or so, and all, and and then the and the and the findings or the responses I uh, started becoming repetitious, and so I began to realize that. You know, after I do about eight or ten at the most interviews, I began to kind of understand where people were coming from. So, I understand statistically uh, why you need, let's say, thirty or so. Um, but um, but I also understand that if I can do that qualitatively, if I can understand what's motivating people, and um, uh, it's then it gives you a different kind of data. Obviously, that's why we call it qualitative. So it's. Um, you know, it's it's about it's about understanding, not you know, not just counting. Um, and I know you're you know you're a stats person, so you understand how to get more understanding than I do out of statistics because of the because you can make them you know turn flips. But um, but I but I like that personal interaction with qualitative that I can really kind of get under somebody's skin. Wonderful. So, what do you think is most misunderstood about qualitative research? You know, I tell you, I think I think I have a new perspective on that. When you ask me what's most misunderstood, I think one of the qualitative real problems over the years has been that it's, it's, it has been, and I think it actually has been, um, uh, difficult and slow. Um, and I think that has been its. Uh, I think that's been true actually over most of my career. That's not so much true anymore uh, with the technology and the um, well, the technology that's available both from. Uh, online tools and for mobile tools, um, and uh, that now you know things are you, things are virtual. Things are global. Are uh, you know tools are virtual. Uh, tools are global. Uh, a an individual person can be in literally five or time zones in a single day and doing interviews if they use if they use the inter, if they use online tools or mobile tools. Um, so I think the pers and and so the qualitative wheels that used to turn very slowly and we used to talk about weeks and uh, and or even months getting a project done. Well, now we're talking about days and and honestly, we've got a product where we talk about hours. Uh, you know, how many hours is it going to take to get this project done? So 
um, that perception. I think I think one of the I think the horizon for qualitative research is the, is that those perceptions of of slow and difficult are going to go away uh, because of, because of not because of the technology in being able to access people remotely. Um, and be, being able to understand them through automated translations and through um, um, automated uh, text analytics and things like that that are going to make that are going to speed up the process to such a degree that we're not going to think of qualitative as being uh, that you know kind of ponderous uh, discipline. I'll have to admit I was one of those people who who would think it takes longer to do the qual side of things, but just like in the quant world, everything is. Is speeding up. It's getting easier to do things more quickly. So, I'm glad to hear qualitative is benefiting from technology in that same way. Yeah, um, it is. I don't. You know, the the uptake is the uptake is not as fast as I, in qual as I think it is in quant, just because the the need and the understanding and frankly the personalities involved are different. But uh, but it's coming along. Uh, okay. Is a question. Um, what new research method shows the most promise? Wow, there's a that's a that's a big um, that's a big question. Um, well, when you talk about really new and you talk about qualitative, there's a lot of new stuff in qualitative. Um, but when you talk about most promise. Tell you what I'm excited about, and it's not really here yet. Um, I'm ex I'm really excited to learn more about virtual reality. Um, like Second Life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but you know how that how to um, apply. You know, really in research, most of what we do is we we find out what the what the technologies are that are emerging, and we see how we can apply them to in our instance, qualitative. And so this emerging uh, virtual reality is, I think, really an interesting field um, that because it, again, allows you, to, would allow you to do things um, really quickly across time zones and across geography um, really well. So I think that's going to be, I think we're, we're, I think within the next couple of years, we're going to be at a tipping point that that's going to start uh, be, uh, that's going to start taking off, and, and we'll see more and more ways to use it. I look forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it really will be. So do you have um, any advice for new researchers? Wow, advice for new researchers. Um, you know, hmm. you know, I think it is... I think it's you have to be a lifelong learner in research, and you have to be willing to change, especially today, because the um, the the technologies and the market is moving so incredibly quickly. Technology, whether it, even in a focus group, a, tip, a traditional focus group, technology is changing everything, and so you you need to be technology. You don't have to be savvy, but you have to have an aptitude, I think, for te technology, just to be willing to kind of take it on and learn about it. Uh, but you have to be willing to adapt and willing to change and willing to think about how to do things differently. I think one of the problems we have in our industry is we we uh, we kind of get we kind of get in stuck into um, um, into methods that we understand, we know, and we have good experience with, and it's very difficult for especially for research agencies a lot of times to break outside of that uh, box and do new things. And if, and I think young researchers particularly are at an advantage because they know the technology and they can kind of lead the charge on how to understand the application of whether it be technology or just new things to research and, and not settle for the status quo. Uh, they really need to push the envelope and say, why is it we can't do this in a week or why is it we can't do it this way? Um, and get good, good. I would ask. I would. I think they need to push the rest of some some of us old folks on those things. <laughs> I'm in agreement with you there. I do see a lot of um, not fresh faces who become so comfortable with how things are always done that to bring something new forward, uh, it's it just it's disturbing. It's it's scary. 
So to have a, a new person who's in there saying, come on, let's try it. Why can't we do this? I, I think that's a, some great advice. And as you mentioned, it is lifelong learning. You learn a lot of new things when you just start in research, but you need to keep learning the entire path of your career. Mm -hmm. Well, after all, that's kind of what, that's what keeps it fresh and fun, isn't it? Absolutely. That's what keeps the clown hat on your head. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So how do you have time to do everything you do? You have been a state senator, which I find amazing. Um, you founded a school. You serve on the MRA board. You run a company. How do you fit everything into your day? You know, I am really, really fortunate um, in that um, I have um, I have the, the good fortune to have some really outstanding people around me that um, that uh, I trust, and they are actually better at what they do than I am, and so I. Um, uh, I can trust them to take care of things that I really don't have to be in the middle of it. Uh, the truth is that I am not very good at most of the things that we do, and so I need to make sure that we've got that. I, I, I just have to have people that are, and and what I have found is that um, um, if I can surround myself with really capable people, and um, uh, I look good <laughs> even when I don't really know, um, even when I don't really know what I'm talking about, it makes me look good. And, 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 you know, when they're in their sweet spot and they're doing the things they're really good at, I find that they're really happy, too, and they're, re they're really fulfilled. And, we have, and so we have a lot of fun along the way. So that's, you know, I'm a little bit, um, I don't know that I'm ADD, but I, I, I like different projects. And so I do have several things going on. I enjoy that. Uh, but I have, it's only because I have really terrific people around me that, that take care of things and allow me to, allow me to kind of bop from one thing to another. Okay. Uh, here we have another question. Um, who do you admire most in the market research industry and on those lines outside the market research industry? Ooh. You know, and, and, and the person that comes to mind, um, who the person I admire most, and I think it's just because we have been friends for so long, and I do have a tremendous amount of respect for her, and that is um, Pat Sabina is a um, qualitative researcher. She has been doing, she has been doing focus groups and qualitative research for 50 years, and um, uh, to me that's just mind-boggling. Um, the changes she's seen. <laughs> I'm sorry? The changes she has seen. Oh, exactly, and that's one of the things I admire about her is because she is, um, she's willing to do, um, she's willing to do online, and yet, she, you know, she's been doing IDIs and focus groups for 50 years, but she also does online. You know, I, you know what? I want to add another name to that um, for the for the exact same reason. Judy Langer. Judy Langer is another researcher out of New York. She founded QRCA. She was, she has been doing research for years, and she was an er, and she's been doing research for probably 50 years in qualitative like focus groups. And um, she, probably in her 60s, was, one, was an early adopter of online bulletin boards. And I admire the heck out of that. That's just amazing. So those are some people that come to mind. So that, that sounds marvelous. I, I would like to be the person who always knows that this is going to be the next cool thing, so I'm going to start it now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, okay, let me ask you one last question here. Uh, what is the one thing you wish market researchers were a lot better at? Um, a lot better at. Um, you know, and I'm gonna. This is gonna be probably a little bit from just my perspective, uh, given our company uh, where we are. I wish researchers were better at really, truly, um, uh, kind of to use a cliche, partnering with their client. But I'm going to explain what I mean, specifically what I mean by that. Um, we have um, we see um, researchers uh, kind of taking direction from clients and pushing them those that direction to us, and when, and then we have to kind of execute because we do a lot of recruiting and we do a lot of project management and those types of things. And, and what we find a lot of times is the researchers 
are afraid of the clients and they're a little bit afraid to um, to push back on the researchers when something doesn't make sense or when something's going to be really difficult for us or really um, uh, not going to be really good research. And so I think what I think researchers um, need to uh, take to um, kind of put on the mantle of expert consultant and uh, realize that they know as much or more than their clients most of the time and they need to have those kind of consult consultative discussions to make sure that when the research is, is, is put together uh, that it's something that will get to the information um, that they need and along and kind of the same along the same lines it goes to what I was saying before I think that's one of the reasons why why researchers are not very good at innovating a lot of times is because they're really trying to do what the client wants them to as opposed to as opposed to pushing the clients to do things that are going to be great research. That's a fabulous way to end off today. Um, Jim, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today and for being so candid. <laughs> well, it has been a pleasure, Annie. I really appreciate you inviting me. This is a, a great format and a lot of fun. All right. Uh, so, folks, if you have any other questions for Jim, feel free to get in touch with him via email, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, the video will be available online soon, and we will send everyone the link to that. Uh, here's wishing, wishing every one of you top-notch response rates and lots of engagement. Bye, everyone.